prepared to make a number of targets, successive national design contributions, but it intends to achieve target shots using less mitigation measures to the aim of achieving the objectives of such contributions. <coughs> Whilst it does not specify numbers, it can set numeric targets and undoubtedly sets objectives. And our environmental project collection objectives are Tuesday's work every day, we'll come back later. And it undoubtedly requires a partnership to do things, including the ways I did. Well, then, for that bundle there, I turned to call number one, which has been a green shot now to the effects of chronology effect. And that's call number one, page one. Where that article is to is, that's why I thought we had a position now, and I really think that's all about that. Because we are also looking at the sum of the data, and we are concerned with the sequence of time. You will see, well, that's the reference file, I'm looking now at page C3, C13. The reference file refers variously to the judgment, and to the green set of column graph below, and also the first place of the flight chain graphs. I'll only take to a few of those, because my best mostly wasn't here sufficient. And there are also some references to some of the core bundles below, and that I have here, I'll put that on the other, and I'll correct it to all those bundles, and I need to rewrite one of those, at least the reference to your bundles. Long introduction to the short points. Right. And page three, first day of my purposes is the 26th of November 2008. Highlight that one for you, boys. Yes. Slide check that. And next day for my purposes, um, page nine, the lot of December 2015, you've seen this already, Harris Agreement adopted. Yes. And um, put to page March 2016, WSP, that's the state's uh, experts, produced a phrase of sustainability ABS survey reports. That's the uh, survey report for the SCA <coughs> environmental reports, if I can translate that. Yes. I've got a document reference there, CB11. Stroke 17, it is unhelpfully to the bundles below. You have that in, I think it's called Hillingdon Bundle Number 8 at page 1337. I may need to go yes. to that later. So I'll yes. correct it now. Without taking any time now, and I'm sure we can manage for the moment, um, in due course it would be helpful, I think, to have these references brought up to date. Uh, I'm sure that can be done by the collective team. Thank you. I just wanted to correct that one for now, if I may. That, that would make our task easier. So what we've seen, my lord, is that that scoping exercise, and you'll see this again in my submissions in due course when I come to uh, my SEA arguments, uh, that is March 2016. Yes. And um, over the page, page 10, foot of the page, we, we have the Climate Change Committee published UK Climate Change Plan of Action following the Paris Agreement. The Climate Change Committee, as you'll have seen, is a statutory creature whose advice needs to be taken by the Secretary of State in relation to climate change obligations. I'm not going to take time on that, but they have a specific statutory role in that regard. I will yes. come back in a moment when I've looked at the chronology to the content of that advice. Yes. Um, we then see at uh, uh, page 12, November 2016, Paris Agreement ratified by UK. We then see page 16, the dates here are given as 8 January to 25 February 2018, and slightly unhelpfully, um, it then starts off by telling us what happened in 2015, yeah. with a narrative text. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's report into the global implications of crossing the threshold of 1.5 degrees global warming was commissioned by governments in 2015. The relevance of that, my lords, will appreciate because the 1.5 degrees is the Paris uh, aspiration. So the report that was commissioned in 2015, we're now told the draft report was reviewed by governments around the world between the 8th of January and the 25th of February of 2018. So no dispute, but that the UK government had the draft report of the IPCC, not by this point a public document, in the January to February period. Then on page 18, 17th of April 2018, the government announced that the Commonwealth held heads of government meeting that after the IPCC report later in the year, it would seek advice from the Climate Change Committee on the implications of the Paris Agreement for the UK's long-term emissions reduction targets. That's following on from the drafts it had seen. It says, well, there's nothing here to make us realise we need to at least commission investigation by climate change. Yes. Then we have 5th of June 2018 publication of the various documents, the suite of documents comprising the ANPS and its related matters. So the ANPS in its final but pre-designated form and the associated responses, consultations and proposal of sustainability and so on. And then final point in the chronology for my purposes is on page 21. 26th of June 2018, AMPS designated. I said I would go back, and if I put that bundle 
that down for now. I'll do so now. It's in the Climate Change Supplementary Bundle. So look, if I may, at what the Climate Change Committee said in October 2016. You have that at page 22. If you've got tabs, that will be in tab 2. So, so it starts at page 20, but I want to go to page 22. 1920. So this is an extract, a key extract from the October 2016 Climate Change Committee was report. So can you give us that reference again, please? I'm sorry, it's Climate Change Supplementary Bundle, tab 2, if you've got tabs. Yes. Page 19, cover page. Can you give us the same references that we've had before? So which is, I think this is number five or six. It's called, uh, I'm told it's called the Friends of the Earth Supplement. It is. The folder I have has a spine um, note saying Supplemental Bundle, Friends of the Earth Appeal Only. That's the fellow. That's the one. So within that, have two or page 19, depending on which one you think is more helpful. Yes. That is the October 2016 report. Yep. Page 22, if you would, please. I just want to look at a few very few highlights. Paragraph 1 is headed, page 22, UK and international ambition. It tells us about the, 20, the Paris Agreement. And it explains in summary form, and I won't take you through it, what you've seen in the original text of the Paris Agreement. In other words, tells us what the current UK targets are, and says, in my summary, more will be needed yes. to achieve this aim. This is the second bullet point. The agreement officially sets a target for net zero global emissions in the second half of the century. Yes. Then the bottom of that section one, um, below the, all the various bullet points, we welcome the government's commitment to ratifying the Paris Agreement by the end of the year. The clear intention of the agreement is that effort should increase over time. While relatively ambitious, the UK's current emissions targets are not aimed at limiting global temperature to as low as a level as in the agreement, nor do they stretch that far into the future. So that's a recognition that the UK's current statutory ambition is not sufficient in those ways to meet the Paris aspiration. Yes. The Climate Commission change then analyses the UK's current ambition and including some analysis of the various existing carbon budgets <coughs> and how on track or not we are to meet them. And then on page 24... middle of the page by the upper hole punch, we currently have no scenarios for how the UK can achieve net zero domestic emissions. That's the Paris aspiration. Yes. So not suggesting that there's nothing to be done, quite the contrary. And on page 25 in your bundle... Well, does that assume, um, as its premise, if you will, um, that the UK can achieve net zero domestic emissions by a particular date, whatever it is. And this is a question of how, not whether. But it, it, may, it may well be that, my Lord, but the, but the point is, that what it's saying is that the current statutory regime is not focused on that as well. Yes, but, but the focus is on the question of how, <coughs> not the question of whether. Both acceptable, yes. Yes, I see. Then, then we have on page 25, um, heading strategies for hard to treat sectors, and within that uh, first paragraph and in the last but one paragraph on the page, it is a recognition that aviation is what's called a hard-to-treat sector. Yes. That's because whilst some things can be done by way of innovation, there may be an irreducible minimum 
contribution which has to be offset by other things. That's the simple, my simple characterization of it. Where, where were you reading from just and now? So the first paragraph, even with full deployment of the known low carbon yeah. technologies behaviours, yeah. some UK emissions will remain, thank you. especially from hard to treat sectors, aviation, agriculture and parts of industry. Yes, thank you. But they can't be reduced to zero. The effect of that, therefore, is it has to be offsetting somewhere else. Um, however, in terms of what they recommend at that stage, this is page 26, <laughs> paragraph 4, section 4, implications for UK policy priorities in the nearer term. They say this, opening paragraph, current policy in the UK is not enough to deliver the existing carbon budgets that Parliament has set. In other words, we're not even on track to meet the existing statutory targets. So in that context, go to paragraph three, however, we recommend government doesn't alter the level of existing carbon budgets or 2050 target now. So in the context of not being even on track to do what we've statutorily signed up to do, we suggest we don't change those things, but clear signposting that more will need to be done in the future. So this is the important point for my purposes. Mm. By no means saying, by no means saying, Paris, tick, no more needed. No. Need quite the contrary, quite the contrary. Um, so well, that was October 2016. You've seen um, the emerging uh, understanding of that heading forward to February 2018. Yeah, Before you move, move on, Mr. Paul, the on. Climate Change Committee say in their conclusion, we recommend the government doesn't alter the level of existing carbon budgets now. How do you account for that recommendation at the end, given what went before? Um, well, uh, what they're in effect saying is because we're not even on track to meet those, um, uh, we're not suggesting you change those targets now. Best concentrate on meeting the existing targets, but signposting that those targets are not going to meet the Paris Ambition Energy Clause. Do what you can now. But this is very much an open uh, and unfulfilled Paris uh, commitment. So this is by no means giving the indication that we can sit back and assume we're on track for Paris. Well, you would <coughs> emphasise in the next paragraph, would you, the priority for now. Absolutely. Uh, and then at the foot of the page, um, we will advise on whether to set a new long-term target and so forth. But, uh, that's but, all heading near, near, near term. Yes, that, that all plays into the same theme. Exactly yeah, right. Thank you. Well, Lord, then pick it up, if I may, in the um, AMPS itself. We've got this in core bundle number five. This, of course, is the focus of everybody's challenges. We have it. differentiating factor between the three shortlisted schemes, of course the backlog is this consideration of alternative options, the government has considered the issue of carbon emissions given the government's commitment to tackle climate change and its legal obligations under the Climate Change Act 2008. Now that, that is the first mention of um, the parts I'm going to take to at least of the climate change obligations and one of the issues we posed to the Divisional Court was whether those <coughs> obligations as expressed through this document um, what was their scope? And I'll come to that in a moment. But various places there are references to existing climate change obligations. And that's the first one. You also see that, for example, over the page of 3.66, where the sentence is, this further analysis reinforces the conclusion that any one of the three shortlisted schemes could be delivered within the UK's climate change obligations. Dot, dot, dot. And what the 
Regional Court confirmed in relation to each of these mentions is that that meant the 2008 statutory target and no more. Um, and in terms of what's said in 366, what the Regional Court explained was um, that that conclusion in 366 was not to be taken to preempt an analysis at the development control stage of whether, in fact, the scheme that came forward at that stage would meet those aspirations. So this is not a conclusion that forecloses debate later, no. and that's important for our purposes. Yes. That matters when we then get chapter 4, page 2453, to assessment principles. And this, of course, is telling the developer and the world how the scheme will be considered at the development control stage. But within that chapter, if we go to 2460, Starts 441, the Planning Act 2008 requires the Secretary of State to have regard to the desirability of mitigating and adapting to climate change in designating an NPS. And we have footnote 125, <coughs> and footnote 125 takes us to the Planning Act 2008, section 10.3a. Yeah. Our friend. Yes. However, and I'm not going to take you through it, the text in 442 to 452, consistent with the heading is entirely focused on climate change adaption. In other words, the other limb of the 10.3a obligation. Yes. And there is no 10.3a reference anywhere else in the document to consideration of the other limb of 10.3a, the mitigation, the mitigating obligation. Is that not dealt with anywhere? It's not dealt with anywhere. Go on, my lord. There's, no, sure. there's no express reference in my book. Well, well, Mr. Walker, to make that clear, if my lord, for example, if you go forward to page, um, you go forward to page 2479, yeah. which is a further section on carbon emissions, it starts at 2477. There is discussion in this case, and indeed there is discussion elsewhere in this document. My lord, friend's point, to be clear, is it says that none of that discussion is specifically referenced to 10.3a. Well, my lord, he's right, there's no footnote to 10.3a. But what he can't say, I don't think he is saying, is that there's no, there's no dealing with this mitigation in the book. I'm, I'm coming to the section of this bill, so the reach is concerned about as you can imagine, my lord. <coughs> yes. My point was a simple one about the reference. Yes, we understand um, both. No grander than that. Part of so 2477, position. where Mr. Marici would take you. 2477. I'm sorry, 2477. Yes, thank you. Yes. There is a heading here, 5.6, carbon emissions, and then 5.69, the Planning Act 2008 requires that a national policy statement must give reasons for the policy set out in the statement, and an explanation of how the policy set out in the statement takes account of government policy relating to mitigation of and adaptation to climate change. What's the <coughs> And 162 is Planning Act 2008, Section 58. And that sentence is a perfectly acceptable summary of 57 and 58, the reasons obligation and the, in particular, reasons obligation in relation to government policy. So that is the uh, opening and quite proper introduction to the section I'm about to take you through. Um, and it is focused on Section 5A, which indeed asks for an explanation of how the NPS deals with government policy related to climate change. Now, there is a distinction between our case here and Mr. Uh, Crossland's case, because we say we recognise, I think agreeing with the Secretary of State, that government policy for those purposes essentially means <coughs> the Climate Change Act. Mr. Mr. Crossland takes a different view. But for our purposes, we are happy to say that that's a reference to the Climate Change Within that section... Sorry, just before you move on, Mr. Wolf, in 569, after the footnote reference to 162, the sentence, 
the government has a number of international and domestic obligations. Uh, is that point taken anywhere further in this no, it's section? Just, it's just, it's just a, it's a, uh, a teaser, if you like. That's maybe not talking about broken words. Good, good. I, no I noted that that sentence might be contrasted with the first sentence of 5.71, that the UK's obligations on greenhouse gas emissions are set under the 2008 Climate Change Act. But look, yes. Do, that, that, do you accept that proposition? Um, uh, the UK's obligations are set on the that's the statement of the, of the statutory framework. Yes, that's what, well, that's well, what sets the Well, UK's. it is, but it, it, query, does it cover the full panoply of the UK's international and domestic obligations? Well, we, we, we say not, we say not, and that's part of the underpinning of our ground when it comes to uh, strategic environmental uh, assessment, uh, yes. uh, field ground C. Uh, and in, indeed, you'll see in a moment, I'll take you to a tension that there is between this document and a document printed at the same time, produced at the same time by the government, which tried to explain it, which again throws in a confounding element in relation to international obligations. Um, but but um, that was part of the backdrop in which uh, we uh, pushed upon the divisional court as to what these reasons actually were and meant and whether they were sufficient. Uh, and we were told by the divisional court, and it's not being challenged by anybody, that each of the references to UK's obligations in here. Um, at least in terms of the test that we're coming to at 582, which I'll get to in a moment, are references to the domestic statutory obligations and not to any inter anything international. So, so the, the, the second sentence of 569, I think I'm agreeing with my Lord, goes nowhere, um, uh, but it undoubtedly mentions those other obligations. Right. It doesn't deny their existence, but it doesn't take them anywhere. Um, right. Over the page, 2478, um, Impacts, it's worth just bearing in mind what it said at 574. The carbon impact of proposed development falls into four areas increased emissions from air transport movements, both international and domestic, as a result of increased demand, emissions from airport buildings and ground operations, emissions from surface, surface transport accessing the expanded airport, and emissions caused by construction. The first of these is by far the largest of these impacts. So that's the impact of international aviation which comes from the increased capacity and the increased demand, which is therefore met. And that's the bit that plays in that slightly nuanced way into the UK's target, which I showed you earlier on. But that is the big impact. It's not about falling concrete or moving lorries. It's about aeroplanes in the sky. And then we come to the bit which tells the, uh, uh, the applicant's assessment, 576, pursuant to the terms of the Environmental Impact Assessment Regulations, the applicant should undertake an assessment of the project as part of the environmental statement to include an assessment of any likely significant climate factors. The applicant should provide evidence of carbon impact of the project, including embodied carbon, both from the construction and operation, so that it can be assessed against the government's carbon obligations, including but not limited to carbon budgets. Now that's an example of where the divisional court said that is a reference only to the statutory obligations and not to anything else. Then we have a section headed mitigation on the face of page. That is about mitigating the impacts of the development on climate change. Then we have a section on decision making. And, and in a sense, 5.82, for our purposes, is perhaps the most important paragraph of the document because it sets the test, or part of the test, to be considered at the development control stage. 5.82, any increase in carbon emissions alone, <coughs> so the focus is on carbon emissions, is not a reason to refuse development consent, unless the increase in carbon emissions resulting from the project is so significant it would have a material impact on the ability of the government to meet its carbon reduction targets, including guard carbon budgets. So that test sets a classic planning type test to be considered at the DCM stage. Yes, and there's no question as to what that means. Uh, it distinguishes clearly between carbon emissions per se, <coughs> on the one hand, and material impact on the other. Is that right? Well, Lord, yes, I, I, absolutely. But in terms of the carbon emission, what we're counting, yes. which is, the, which is the, uh, uh, where that takes the development control decision maker, um, before I 
before I before I take you to what the divisional court said, yeah. uh, which I'll, I'll show you in one second, can I just show you another document in this bundle, um, which is sorry, um, just before you leave that. Uh, sorry if you're going to come back to this. Well, I'm I'm, I'm tiptoeing around. I'm not leaving it completely. But by well, way, well, be because we've got it in front of us, can I just ask you this? Is it common ground that in 5.82, the phrase to meet its carbon reduction targets is a reference exclusively to the target in the Climate Change Act? Um, that is what the Divisional Court held, and that's not been challenged yet. So, so, so yeah, we... Well, well that, that, that may matter, Mr Wolf, because if that stands, and it may be right, mm. if that stands, this policy statement would set the framework for what the decision maker is going to be applying as the relevant test in deciding whether to refuse development consent. Exactly right. In other words, it fixes that consideration at this point. Well, it, 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 exactly right. I, I don't want to go too far into that. Can I, can I, can I just hold the thought for a moment and come back to the original court, what the original court said about this? Because there's a lot of debate and a lot of unpacking of this in the original court. It may be helpful to see the nuances of that. Mm. So I'm not, I'm not ducking the question. This I'm may be an important point. It, park it for a second. It's a very, a very important question, my lord. Very important. <coughs> um, can I just sit in this bundle, sh show you um, in, in tab, um, uh, so it's still tab uh, bundle five, 2599, you have the government's response to consultations on the AFPS. This was published at the same time. Within that, you go to 2652, so this is a familiar style of document. 2652, paragraph 8.6. <coughs> yes. Um, the airport's NPS, so this is obviously not a legal document, it's an explanatory document. Clearly sets out a number of measures the government expects any scheme promoters to take in order to limit the carbon impact of projects. Dot dot dot. The airport's NPS also states that any increase in carbon emissions alone is not a reason to refuse development consent. Unless the increase resulting from projects is so significant, it would have a material impact on the ability of the government to meet its domestic and international carbon carbon reduction targets, including carbon budgets set under UK legislation. So, so that is. Um, well, then it says, I'm sorry, what it means. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but then it says Climate Change Act 2008. Yeah. Yes. So that, that, that's undoubtedly the UK <coughs> legislation, yeah. but, but what, it, what it confusingly, uh, I put it that way, introduces is something wider, picking up a point a lot of It does, but it also uses the word including. Exactly, yes. Exactly so right. it, it could be, I don't know, it could be construed uh, where it says in parentheses Climate Change Act 2008, that that's simply the bit which is following the word including, not necessarily saying that's the only thing. Uh, absolutely, that, 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 if, if this were if this were the thrust of what 582 said, we might have a, uh, uh, some discussion about the word targets, international targets, but if this were what 582 said, um, it would be cast in wider terms, at, at my point of view, preferable terms, if I can put it that way, mm. to its narrow focus on climate change targets, climate change act targets, I'm sorry. Um, let me then, if I may, take, take you to what the Divisional Court said um, on these bits, because it wasn't something for some detail. And you've got this in bundle one at page 621, I call bundle one 621. Two, the 
reference in paragraph 5.82 of the ANPS to carbon reduction targets in the context of an application of the EPA refers to the targets in force at the date of the application. So in other words, it's, it's a floating temporarily. It's not fixed as at June 2018. Then three, the reference to carbon reduction targets, including carbon budgets, is to the targets, including those in carbon budgets, set by the Climate Change Act 2008. It cannot refer to international targets, such as the objectives of the Paris Agreement, for various reasons. So, disabusing anybody of the, of the thought they might have had that somehow this was intended to include those international obligations, which the second sentence that we looked at earlier on might have perhaps hinted at. That's probably the most important in terms of the debate we've been having this morning. Yes. Then, over the page, at level four, <coughs> Vision Corp made clear, last three or four lines of the before, carbon emissions, emissions resulting from the project clearly includes emissions from international aviation. In other words, it's not just the concrete and the lorries, it's also the international aviation. And five, almost emphatically, um, will clearly include emissions from aircraft using heat flow in flight. So it picks up all of the things, so 5.82 in other words wraps up all of those impacts that, that AMPS had identified earlier on, but sets the go-no-go -no -go test in 5.82 by reference to Climate Change Act targets on their own. And that, that therein lies the problem. Yeah, to the exclusion of the Paris Agreement. To the Paris Agreement and other things, which I'll come to in due course. And you say that was wrong. say is that um, had the Secretary of State, looking as it were to what might have happened, had the Secretary of State um, discharged his obligations that we'll come to in a moment, lawfully we might have had, and that's all I need to say, a different 582 that set the test for development control stage in different terms, including cast more widely. Yes. And in terms of that, that, as it were, that end destination, um, can, I, can I take you to put back Bundle 5, but take you to Volume 3, the call on Volume 3. Are we leaving the judgment now? We're leaving the judgment now. Yeah. Okay. The reference again, I'm sorry. Uh, it's Bundle 3, page 1354. Okay. This is in the Secretary of State, or 1355, Secretary of State's mental detailed grounds of resistance. This amendment, I'm going to take you through the background of that with you two, followed an application by the claimants for disclosure of materials that had been before the Secretary of State in the period, the early part of 2018, that might have informed his understanding of Paris and so on. The Secretary of State vigorously resisted that in the preliminary hearing, and, and the consequence of that was the, 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 the basis for that was what we have at subparagraph 9 on page 1355, so 62.9. The Secretary of State will not pursue any discretion arguments that there was, brackets, little a, no emerging material within government evidence in development <coughs> the implications of the Paris Agreement, or B, that such material would highly likely have made no difference to the decision to designate the AFPS. There was no need to do so because he was not obliged to consider such material in the first place. So it's a legal argument. But no, but will, no discretion argument. There's no discretion argument taken against me. So it has good. been or is now Absolutely. pursued. Absolutely. So on, on ground two, that's on his ground, on Mr. Wolf's ground two, that's true, not on ground three. Yes, okay. indeed. Yes. <laughs> this relates specifically to ground two. Uh, a and B, I think. Well, A, maybe. Uh, yeah, so it's a, on, on this appeal, it's A. Yeah. Mm. Ground two below, yes, yes. whereas there is a discretion argument on, on what was ground three, now ground C. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So, so, so um, the material therefore emerging, let me put it in this way, in the early part of 2018, that you saw the draft of the IPCC report seen by governments in draft four and so on, are, are what the material we would have pointed to if necessary, were we being faced with an argument we're not being faced with. Yes, I hope that makes sense. it does. 
I suppose you could say about intergenerational questions, but might it also have a different temporal aspect, which is that as time goes by, uh, the needs of future generations become also the needs of the present generation. Yes, well, in the sense that they become the current generation at the time. Indeed. But, but in, 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 in so far as it's been used as a, uh, a, 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 a planning test here. Yes, yes, quite. Yes, it is, as a, as a as if you like, um, fixed planning test, it clearly has the characteristic that you mentioned. Yes. Obviously, though, today's children will become tomorrow's adults, and of course. will go. But in terms of, uh, from the point of view of today's adults, we are concerned with um, meeting our needs, and the needs of our children, without compromising the needs of our, our as yet unborn great-grandchildren. Yeah. Yes, I understand that. The NPPF goes on to say that achieving sustainable development means that a planning system has three overarching objectives, yes. which are independent and need to be pursued in mutually supportive ways, namely an environmental objective, an economic objective, and a social objective. Now, nobody is saying, nobody is saying that the environmental component of the sustainable development obligation trumps other things. And, and that is why when we look at 10.3a, or 10.3, I'm sorry, it is only a mandatory component of the sustainable development objective, and even then, it's not, it's not exhaustive of it, and even then, um, uh, mitigating climate change is only one element of it. 
So nobody is suggesting that the environmental uh, concerns are trumped all, but they are a mandatory process, part of the process through this uh, decision-making framework. Mr. Wolf, I understand that concession, if it is a concession that you make, and I can understand why the Divisional Court refers to the National Planning Policy Framework, but that, that is simply a statement by the executive of this country at a particular point in history. Indeed. What we may have to construe is a statutory phrase which is used by Parliament, sustainable development. And it wouldn't necessarily follow that what the executive thinks that means at any given point in history is actually what it means. But, look, that, that is all obviously entirely correct. Um, the court has uh, the benefit, I think it's a benefit, of the uh, WWF written submissions, um, which pick up on not exactly, but pretty much exactly that point, yes. because I don't think I've had an opportunity to see them, but they, they uh, give a helpful analysis of the international law mm. um, context, and also as part of that, the way in which the Brundtland definition, which is now relatively old, has subsequently evolved. evolved. Right. So, so uh, uh, as Lord, Lord Justice Steve Riley says, uh, the executive has picked up a point in time version, that international concept, if that's what the domestic legislation is referring to, is evolving, as WWF explains, where domestic legislation picks on an international concept, it tracks that international concept. That's their submission, not mine, but I'm not going to say any more about it, other than to uh, make the point to the court that, from our point of view at least, their submissions are entirely supportive of and embraced within our case. Mm. The reason we don't make any more submissions on the specifics of that definition are that the point we extract from it is the temporal point that I've identified. Yes, yes. And its relevance to us is in the fact, which I'll come to shortly, that um, uh, the statutory targets and the assessment by reference to the statutory targets only goes to 2050, whereas the development has been identified as having a lifetime to 2086, so beyond the statutory targets, um, and its benefits have been assessed to 2086 as part of that process. So, so that matters to us because what it means is that the climate change window 2050 to 2086 has not been part of the evaluation because it falls over the edge of the Climate Change Act statutory targets. We say that matters in terms of the sustainable development prism through which this is all seen. Yes, and you bring that within the general um, scope, if you will, of at least the environmental objective inherent in the concept of sustainable development. Well, and and, and um, I don't <coughs> do that implicitly because it's spelled out in Section 10.3a. It, yes. 10.3a is not just an environmental imperative, but it's the desirability yes. of mitigating climate change is a specific mandatory statutory component of the objective, and we say over a longer time frame. Yes, it spells it out. You spells say. it out, exactly right. Um, so when we then come back, if I may, with that slight diversion to 10.3, 10 uh, 10.2 10 and 10.3a, <coughs> planning act. Yes. We say that the framing of the language in 10.2 and more particularly 10.3a is completely open and not to be constrained, not to be constrained by reference to domestic climate change act obligations, government policy, be, be it whatever it may. It is entirely, entirely open textured and the question of desirability, let me just unpack the whole uh, provision, there is a mandatory objective in a context of which there is a mandatory consideration, which is, and this is a sense of factual question, the desirability of mitigating climate change. The planning system is well used to evaluating, for example, the desirability of protecting a listed building. That is a factual question, a judgment question. Not a discretion, it's an evaluation. And here it's a match. So here we have a single, we drill down into a single mandatory consideration the desirability of mitigating climate change. Yes. What do you say about the language, um, in particular the use of the 
word the desirability of you rightly I think draw the parallel with the listed buildings act um, how is that if at all different from a concept such as uh, having regard to the effect of development on climate change does it subsume that is it it's a soft, is it, is it it's a softer than that? It's a wider, it's a wider concept. Uh, and, 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 and importantly, from my point of view, it, chain, it chimes very much with the uh, 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 materials I showed you in relation to Paris, which is very much describing an enhanced desirability. It's recognising an enhanced desirability of mitigating climate change. Paris, if you'd like, represented... A, whether, whether you call Paris the trigger or the response to, I suspect it's probably the response to, is the response to scientific and technical understandings. Well, it could be both. The world, it? It, could, it, could be both. Three, it could be both. Mm. But, it, but, it, but it represents, and it more or less says in terms, a ratcheting up of the, what we would say, desirability of mitigating climate change. Yes. And we say it falls four square within the framework of 10 3A. We also, we also say that because there is no necessary connection between these concepts and the statutory 2050 targets, this is apt to include the longer term, that's, the, that's what sustainability gets us, and we also say it's apt to include non-carbon dioxide impacts, where the Climate Change Act yes. talks only of carbon dioxide impacts, and you'll see shortly... Um, that the non-carbon dioxide impacts of aviation, for example, coming from contrails and things like that, I won't go into yeah. technical details to go beyond me, but they are recognised to be significant yeah. if hard to quantify. Yes. Their existence is not doubted, and we say this language is apt to include all of those things. And in, in, short, <coughs> in short, you say the word sustainable is not time-limited. Sustainable is not time limited, and desirability of mitigating climate change is not limited to carbon or statutory targets on carbon. And it's not limited to current government policy. It's not limited to government policy, exactly. Right. So it, it is, that's, since that's the, it's apt to include Paris. And Mr. Mr. Crossman would say Paris is part of current government policy, but that's yeah. not our case. But, uh, he would get to the same destination by a different route. That's it, to make that case. Yes, well, maybe he has two routes to the same destination. Maybe he has two routes to the same destination. Yes. Um, well, to quote the non CO2 and the temporal impacts bit come under our grounds B, oh, sorry, our ground B because the divisional court um, didn't, didn't, didn't deal with those at all in its judgment. Did it? Well, I'll come to that in due course. But, but in terms of the um, to the Paris component of the 10-3A argument, yes. um, can I show you what the Secretary of State's case was and how it was understood by the uh, Divisional Court? You have, um, if you would put the, put the planning act to one side at the moment, but in, in volume three, um, you have a page 1352. Amended 
this way, there is no credible basis for a suggestion that the obligation in section 10.2 and 10.3 in some way extends further than section 5.8 to cover, and it's a qualifying word, I necessity of mandating, consideration of how the NPS policies relate to known developing areas of climate change policy. Rather, those provisions provide a very strong pointer that such matters should not be considered. The clear intention of Parliament being that consideration should be given only to existing domestic obligations and policy commitments in relation to mitigation and adaptation of climate change. That was the Secretary of State's case going into the process. Um, in terms of how the Division of Court uh, characterised that, I can put that bundle down for now if I may. Are we coming back to that or um, not? Not, not, not in short dimensions. So we can pass put that away for me. Yes. Um, within the judgment, at uh, page 638, which is page 624. Yes. By page or paragraph? Uh, para 638. Yeah. You just page give us the paragraph numbers okay. off the page. 638.
which is the argument that the divisional court has said is rejected. But it's difficult to see what else those paragraphs are doing. Now, you would have seen, my lords, that we have um, various arguments as to why um, the way in which the divisional court has drawn together um, the two different acts are impermissible in terms of statutory construction. Yes, but cutting through this, if we can, for a moment, um, your, your task is to present us with your constructional argument, as it were, irrespective of what the divisional court meant in its own reason, isn't it? I think I may need to do both, because of the rolled-up nature of the hearing. Yes, well, perhaps the two tasks come together, but it seems to me, perhaps, that if you start with your own uh, instruction, present that to us, um, you could follow that, if you need to, with any observations about the reasoning of well, well I, I think I may have done the first bit. Yes. I'm not sure I need to say any more about that. We say that the words are openly cast. They're apt to include Paris and... and well, the, 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 I'm, I'm repeating myself. I no, think, well, I what, what I think you need to address is the following. It may be that it is a discretionary relevant consideration, Paris, and, and take the other two glimpse of your argument as well, but just take Paris as an example. Okay. We'll hear from Mr. Ricci in due course, but if I've understood him correctly, and I may not have done, I think he would accept that it is a permissible relevant consideration. What he contests is that it is a mandatory relevant consideration. So that doesn't mean that the statute requires you to ignore it. What it does mean is that the statute does not require you to take it into account. Well, I, I think that is his argument, yeah. and I think that's where the original court goes next. Um, I see, okay. uh, uh, Because that was his alternative positive yes. in the second part of 638. Yes, I see. And it's where the original court goes when we go. I think, I think that's all they were saying. Well, um, it, it, may, it may be, but in, in which case, I don't need to take time. I don't know where to take time on 644, 645, 646. Um, we've given you written arguments about yes. their approach to um, Hansard, their approach to uh, uh, explanatory notes, yes. uh, and so on, which we say is... is Yes, I'm, anyway. I'm simply suggesting to you, Mr. Wolf, that you might use your time more profitably by focusing on your construction. My Lord, I'll do that. Um, my Lord, in, in, term, in terms then of picking up the point my Lord, Lord Justice Singh yes. uh, identified a moment ago, um, that, is indeed, that was indeed Mr. Marich's fallback position mm. as seen by 638, at least in all the submissions, and it's what the Divisional Court then picked up if we run over the page to 647 and 648. Yes. Um, it is there cast by the Divisional Court as being a discretion. We reject that analysis because um, this is a question of judgment. There, is a, there are, if you like, two mandatory, or well, more than two, but my purpose is two particular mandatory components here. One is the mandatory objective of sustainable development. And within that, is the mandatory element of particular regard when having, having had the entire opportunity to climate change. Then, in terms of debate, or the, the switch I made earlier on, in relation to the comparison, say, with the other planning acts, they lead the decision maker to an evaluation of the desirability of mitigating climate change. That is not a discretionary exercise, it is an evaluative exercise coming for the a factual conclusion or a judgment, whatever it may be. You may be right about that, but it may still beg the question of what factors do you take into account in making that evaluation? Is there is there an area of discretion which is left to the decision maker by the statute? So when it comes down to particulars like Paris, post-2050, non-CO2 emissions, I think the argument against you is... Yes, they could be taken into account if the person who has to make the relative evaluative judgment wishes to. But, 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 but I understand, I understand that submission. But we would say in response to it, using using the language of discretion, but translating it, if you like, that the factors that we identify here, in particular Paris most obviously, are obviously material ones, if you want a, a rubric for that. Yeah. Um, because they so obviously, once you, once you accept that 10 3 is cast more widely than the purely domestic statutory framework, yeah. um, it immediately, we say, takes you into 
amongst other things, international obligations. We say that would that would lead it directly into that territory. But Lord, um, in terms of this decision, in our submission, we don't need to succeed, and that is our submission. We say these are obviously material. Well, uh, yes, perhaps another way of putting it, which may equate to that proposition too, is that if there were any discretion as to the taking into account of these considerations, it could only reasonably be exercised by taking them into account. But, yes, the, well, but, but that, that, mer that merges into merges. the concept of obviously material considerations, doesn't well, it? Yes. We're, I think, we're, I think, we're I think there the, is the, jurisprudence on that point, actually. We're in the, we're in the creed and Z type. Yes, uh, exactly. Uh, 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 creed and uh, Z. Territory, obviously, exactly. Yes. Uh, uh, which clearly recognises that there are some things that are obviously material. Well, we would say in this context, mitigating climate change, um, Paris par excellence is obviously material. It's hard to see what, 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 else, what, what could be less obviously material than that. And if not Paris, in this particular context, what else? What, so what, 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 what does this mean? Um, because otherwise it does collapse into the, the Climate Change Act and statutory targets. But on, that, that, that's our submission. I'm not sure I can develop it any further than that on those, those particular points. No, but the, the, the crux of it is that this was, Paris was, and these other considerations too, you say, were obviously material considerations Indeed. on the basis of the Creed NZ and related jurisprudence. Yeah. Well, once you say, for example, just to step into those others, which I know are not part of this ground of appeal, but let me step into it for a moment. Once you recognise that sustainable, sustainable development has an open-ended or long-term temporal nature to it, to introduce some artificial, for those purposes, cut-off of 2050, we say it's, it's clearly wrong. The longer term, 2051 and beyond, is obviously material. Um, to your 10-3A evaluation. Parliament could easily have said so. It could easily have said, if it wanted to mandate the taking into account of international agreements, for example, it could easily have said so. Indeed. Indeed. But instead, what it did was it left it open, yeah. so as not to limit it. You could have said, here are examples of things we want to mandate. Um, it left it open in the language that it used, but that still begs the question for the court of what then is left to be obviously material, and I simply make the submission that the things we identify are obviously material, of which international obligations, most particularly Paris here, because of the point in time, and the temporal reach are candidates for that. Of course, in a sense though, um, we say for the purpose of the overall uh, position of the case, we don't need to win that argument, although it's important to the statutory understanding of the Planning Act, because that matters here. Matter and then you review the Secretary of State, does it matter in other NPS developments and so on? Um, because, in terms of what actually happened here, the interrelationship between the Secretary of State's first and second positions is very important. Because the Secretary of State's proposition was, and that's why, that's why I took you to the way the Secretary of State, sorry, the original court characterised it in 638, was we're required to ignore, but if we're not required to ignore, there is a discretion. That can only, in our submission, get the Secretary of State home if there is evidence of that discretion being exercised in that nuanced way. And there simply is none. There is no, there is no material before the court which gets the court away from the proposition that we thought we needed to ignore it, or if we didn't need to ignore it, we wouldn't have taken it into account in any event. Um, because, as, as, just to pick it back up in the submission of court's uh, judgment, paragraph 647, 648, if there is that evaluative exercise to be done, of course it can only be challenged on ordinary public or grounds. Yeah. But that then requires that there is an evaluative exercise for the court to look at. Is this an argument that the Secretary of State failed to exercise the yes, discretion? Yes, he didn't exercise the discretion. He, didn't, he, he, oh, he said he didn't have. Because his proposition was, I haven't got a discretion. This proposition, in all the materials, until after the judge had floated the possibility of there being a discretion in an interim hearing, this proposition, entirely up to that point, had been, I was required to ignore it. I showed, you, I showed you in that context the paragraph on discretionary relief. Yes. Because I was required to ignore it, you can't complain, but I did. How did the Divisional Court um, grapple with that proposition that the Secretary of State did not exercise the discretion he said he didn't have? Um, uh, it didn't grapple with it at all. It just identified, if you look at 648, that's the end of the point. It just identifies the existence of discretion as if the 
mere existence of the discussion, just to carry on with that language for the moment, even though I don't accept it, is, was an answer to the point. But it can only be an answer to the point if I've lost them all the points so far, if the discretion was exercised and in a way that is potentially when to be reasonable. And you presumably rely on Miss Lowe's evidence at paragraph 458 where she says we took a legal view that yeah. we did not need to look at this at all. Exactly right. Exactly. Therefore, ergo, you say exactly. Exactly. discretion is not exercised. Okay. I, I, I don't want to win a case on that, that for that basis, but if, if, if I do so be it, because it, it matters to get the law right on the way. But even if even if the court were to say this is wider than the 2008 Act, climate change targets, but in an open a, a way that's up to the decision maker, we say that's the, that's the law, that's the law. Or we say that we get the Secretary of State home here because of exactly the point that's yeah. put to me. You, you say that if it's up to the decision maker, the decision maker must think about it. Do it. Is the point. Really, so that, that, that is um, uh, ground A, ground, uh, part of ground two as it was below. Yes. Um, gra ground B is our reasons challenge, um, which really is an adjunct to all of that, uh, 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 and gets, gets me into the game before this court, because as you see, although the divisional court in 638 identified post-2050 and non-CO2 emissions, it didn't actually deal with them at all. We say that falls short of the well-established requirements in relation to um, uh, 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 judges giving reasons. The concept of that, if I can just give the court this, is to go, first of all, if I may, to the climate change annex which we uh, had before, which is in core bundle two, uh, at 723. Agreed, agreed position on climate change, sorry, on the non CO2 impact within the agreed position on climate change. Heading 5, aviation's non CO2 climate effects. Agreed, aviation has a range of impacts on the climate beyond those of CO2 emissions. While uncertainties remain, the accepted scientific consensus is that non CO2 emissions contribute to aviation's total climate impact. The scientific community is currently working on temperature-based metrics, including global warming potential measured over 100 years, which is an example of temporal leach, which is also the metric for comparing gases used by Kyoto and the Climate Change Act. Latest scientific estimates show that the likely total GWP for all aviation emissions to be 1.9 to 2, approximately double that of aviation CO2 emissions alone. So, and then it goes on to explain the scientific uncertainty. So whilst there is scientific uncertainty, about the scale of that, what is not in dispute is that it exists and that it increases beyond the CO2 impact, the GWP on aviation. And, and just to go back to our old friend 5.82 at the AMPS, we say that is plainly something which needed to be part of the 582 DCO test. And indeed, to put that point the other way round, in 582, because 582, 582, I should say, sorry, boxes in the development control stage to only focus on the, CO, the Climate Change Act targets, it specifically excludes consideration of these wider impacts. So that is, put it the other way, another way around in terms of our debate on 10.3a, that would be to ignore plainly material considerations. I may not be following you, I'm sorry, it's my fault. Paragraph 31 summarises the assessment. Paragraph 31 identifies the appraisal of sustainability as referring to this yes. chapter. Well, yeah, but so what we don't see, what we don't see is any consideration of that through the 10 3 a prism feeding into, potentially feeding into 5.82. Oh, I see. <coughs> all, that, all that that tells us in Panda 31 is they cannot be readily quantified, but that, that is not an answer when it comes to assessing the desirability of mitigating climate change. It just makes it harder to assess them. The difficulty with 5.82 
is that as drafted and explained by the original cause, it boxes the developed control stage into looking only at carbon uh, in a way of identifying. Because the Climate Change Act 2008 only sets targets for CO2 emissions. Okay. At least at present. Yeah. Well, there is a power to amend it to yeah. take into account other uh, gases. Yeah. That's what the original cause refers to. In terms of the temporal reach point, um, I just begin to show you one, one reference, if I may. Um, this is in uh, the climate change supplementary bundle, so friend of the earth supplementary bundle, I should say, um, page 39. Sorry, which paragraph? Uh, 6.11.2, I'm sorry. Yes, no, no, I was behind you, thank you. Um, so they modelled those emissions, but considered them only by reference to statutory targets, which only go to 2050, and that says the kicking off point for our temporal reach point, and not within this material, but elsewhere. Of course, they took into account the benefits of the scheme to 2086, as quite rightly they would in the overall evaluation. So what is your point on 6.11.2? Simply to show the court the, uh, if you like, the, date, the range of dates um, and how the modelling was done for emissions over that extended period. Um, but because the evaluative framework was then the 2008 Climate Change Act framework, which only goes to 2050, in effect there is a 36-year period of climate change emissions which are not factored into the DCO uh, 5.82 test. And the 10 3A temporal reach required that they should be. Yes, you say, it was, you, say, you say in effect it was an artificial cut off. Yeah, that's another way of putting it. Eleanor way of putting it. Um, there's, a, there's a respondent's notice point against us on this, um, which in effect says it doesn't matter that the divisional court didn't give its reasoning um, on, on these two elements because you can read across what it said about Paris. Um, we, we say that doesn't get home because um, uh, the divisional court's judgment, and I had these paragraphs open earlier on, 647, 648, in relation to Paris, is entirely bounded, the discretion the discussion we were looking at earlier on, is entirely framed in, grounded in, the nature of Paris and international agreements uh, and the discretion that that led to. So no answer, uh, we say, you can't just read across that analysis. And that, that, in a sense, that's merely part of the, uh, to go back to my Lord's earlier point, um, that's my challenge to the divisional court. Um, it's not, it's only difficult to be able to get to the answer to this court. Yes. yes. I, need to, I need to make that point to get yes. over the hurdle of yes. getting in the door. Yes, I think you do, yes. Um, well, then ground C, um, uh, which is uh, ground three below the SEA ground. Um, yes. Here, um, can, I, can I pick up uh, legal materials, uh, common legal materials, bundle volume one, and go to tab seven, which is the SEA directive. Uh, okay, which volume? Uh, uh, it's uh, volume three. No, oh, sorry, volume one, sorry. Yep. Yes. That's the directive. That's the directive. Of 27 June 2001. Uh, that's right. Yep. <coughs> um, within that, can I dive? 
separate input in visitor to Article 5, if I may, and heading is environmental report. And what we've seen here is that the Appraisal Sustainability took the collect of the uh, role of environmental report for these purposes. Article 5.1, where an environmental assessment is required under Article 3.1, an environmental report shall be prepared in which the likely significant effects on the environment of implement the plan or programme and reasonable alternatives taken into account the objectives and the geographical scope of the plan or programme are identified, described and evaluated. The information to be given for this purpose is referred to in Annex 1. Then it says, by 2, the environmental report prepared pursuant to Paragraph 1 shall include the information that may reasonably be required taking into account current knowledge and methods of assessment. So the 5.2 exit is about, if you like, the technical content, technical components. You don't have to assess things you can't reasonably do so. But the mandatory requirements are set out through the prism of Annex 1. We then go to Annex 1, which is a couple of pages further on, but being a mercifully short directive. The information to be provided under Article 5.1, subject to Article 5.2 and 3, is the following. So if we drop to little e, the environmental protection objectives established at international, community or member state level, which are relevant to the plan or programme, and the way those objectives and environmental consideration have been taken into account during its preparation. So the report has to tell us what those things are and also how it's taken them into account. But the entry point are the environmental protection objectives established at international community or more member level. My focus is on the first of those, environmental protection objectives established at international level. <coughs> and it won't surprise the court to say here, we say Paris is precisely one of those. In terms of how that played out in the uh, uh, SEA itself, can I take you to um, the uh, supplementary uh, bundle, uh, bundle, uh, bundle, uh, page 44, put it behind tab 5. This is an appendix, appendix A9 carbon to the AOS. Legislation. Airports in the UK are covered by a number of pieces of national and European legislation. The following policy and legislation relevant to this assessment are summarised below. Then we've got the UK Climate Change Act, and then below that, there is EU schemes, and there's domestic schemes. So this is the, this is the list within the AOS where it identifies the Annex 1E. Uh, extent, if you like, menu, shopping list of uh, legislative provisions it is dealing with. Um, but the focus, as you see, is entirely on EU and domestic, and not on international, and certainly not on Paris. And, and we say, very simply, and I'll develop some more in a moment, that that is an, an unlawful hole in the report which fatally flaws its role for SEA purposes. In terms of the way the Divisional Court dealt with it, can I take you to that? It's, it's paragraph 650 to 655 of the Divisional Court judgment. Pausing for a second there, 
I absolutely did accept that. I absolutely do accept that proposition before this court. The difficulty for the Division Court of the Secretary of State is that the Secretary of State did not decide that this information was not reasonably required. So that is, if you like, a legal debate operating in a vacuum from what the Secretary of State actually did. It's following down 654. As we've explained under ground 12, that is ground 2, the targets of the Paris Agreement will need to be considered by the UK government and by Parliament to determine whether the carbon targets in the CCA should be amended. The CCC advised the government to possibly amend the need to be. For any of you, Mr. Walton accept at some point the implications of the revised global targets for our domestic targets and whether the last should be amended at all, and if so, how, how will be determined? Plainly work on that matter is currently in hand and decisions have not yet been reached. In those circumstances, we do not think it can be said. The Secretary of State acted irrationally by not addressing the Paris Agreement in the SEA process. Now, that, I uh, envisage, is a reference back to the irrationality debate at 653. Yes. It only be read that way. But that irrationality debate simply doesn't arise, and I'll show you the Secretary of State's case in a moment, I'm slightly ahead of myself, because it wasn't the Secretary of State's case that he had reasonably decided that this was not reasonably required. It just wasn't his case. Pausing while we're there on what the Division of Court says in 654 when we end the page, the proposition or the possibility that these things in international agreements will at some point be incorporated into domestic agreements and the rest of the arrangements, or indeed let's add EU arrangements, cannot be an answer, cannot be an answer to the uh, requirements of the directive, because the directive specifically talks about international obligations and domestic obligations and EU obligations. Um, uh, it is not merely tying one to the domestic implementation of international obligations. It leaves the list completely open. So the fact that in due course something might be translated from the international arena to EU to domestic in some combination of things cannot be an answer to say these mandatory components, because they are mandatory components, in the list in the little e in Annex 1 need to be satisfied. But as I say, the main thrust of that thing uh, that we there is an evaluation which we say simply didn't take place. The original court then turned 655. We also, I'm not sure what the word also is meant to connote there, we also note the explanation that given by Miss Stevenson, and they give a paragraph which I'll take you to in a second, of the detailed consideration given in the AOS to carbon reduction disputes about that, including the targets of the CCA, but don't about that, and, then, and why the objectives of the Paris Agreement were not addressed at that stage. That's the critical bit. We don't consider that that approach can be faulted on any public law grounds, or that it can be said that the Secretary of State failed to comply with Article 5 of the SEA Directive by not addressing the Paris Agreement in the environmental report. And what's, um, what, what that is a reference to is the Secretary of State's case on this point. Well, can I take you were to the Secretary of State's skeleton below. You have this in Volume 2 of the Four Hundreds. Dive into page 792. So it's called Bundle 2. Yep. Paragraph 129. Sorry, the page reference? Uh, 792. Thank you. Sub 1, the following points are made in response. The AOS gave very detailed consideration to carbon impact, so be it that's not an answer to the, the international obligations point. Then the Secretary of State says this the obligation is to have regard to relevant international environmental protection objectives. Just pausing for a second there. The Secretary of State's argument was about relevance, not reasonably required. So the divisional courts focus on the reasonably required question is simply a focus in the air, if you like. It wasn't the Secretary of State's case. That matters in our submission, just at the legal point, because the question of what are the relevant international ob obligations, like questions of relevance generally, is a legal question. A legal question. The question of whether Paris is a relevant international obligation for SEA directed purposes is a question of law for the court, ultimately. And we say it's plainly a relevant one. 
1292 continues, but Stevenson's first witness statement explains why the AOS did not regard the Paris Agreement as relevant. What is relevant in this context is a matter of judgment. We don't accept the last bit, but just focusing on the second, the second sentence. Why the Secretary of State did not regard the Paris Agreement as relevant. Footnote 101, we need to be follow this carefully. 101 is paragraphs 3.125 to 3.128 of her witness statement. That was the Secretary of State's case. And the amended detailed grounds of resistance. I'm not sure that adds anything to the reach you will difficulty to apply if it needs to. But it's 3.125 to 128. And then three, the AOS was scoped, including on carbon change issues, with the statutory environmental bodies. The statutory environmental bodies. Footnote 102. 102, Seamus Stevens' witness statement at 2.29. That takes about, talks about the consultation process. And the AOS scoping report of March 2016, and the scoping responses from statutory environmental bodies. That was the Secretary of State's case on how he, through the evidence of Stevenson, had addressed the question of relevance. As I say, we say the question of relevance is for the court, not the Secretary of State. But even if that were wrong, what the divisional court did, we say, was completely fail to grapple with that evidence in the conclusion which it reached, which I showed you a moment ago. Um, let me take you, if I may, to those, those uh, passages. You have Ms. Stevenson's evidence, is the relevant part of it, in, supplementary, in front of the uh, supplementary bundle at page 86. Skeleton's reference was to 3.125 to 3.129. In 3.125, she references the scoping report, which is March 2016. And then in 3.128, she cross refers to Caroline Lowe's witness statement. And to what it says about the Climate Change Committee's advice on Paris. And she said that for the next page, the AOS has followed this advice. The difficulty with, with all of that, and its reliance therefore on what the Climate Change Committee said on Paris, is that what the Climate Change Committee said on Paris is October 2016, and the scoping report to which she refers in 3.125 is March 2016, and you will recall the March 2016 date in the Secretary of State's footnote skeleton, which I showed you a second ago, footnote 102. And all of that was something that I took the divisional court through perhaps tediously, but at no point do they grapple with it. Put simply, what the Climate Change Committee said in October 2016 cannot explain, cannot explain the scoping report from March 2016. And in terms of that scoping report, her references, 3.125, and this was the point at which I needed to give you some new references because the references in the uh, materials here have been more thick. That is to the scoping report, and you'll recall, so I should have shown you at the time, the Secretary of State's skeleton gave bundle references to the scoping report. Those documents, the scoping report and its appendix, are now in Hillingdon Bundle 8 at pages 30, 1337 and 1381. It was to those documents, March 2016, to which the Secretary of State drew the court's attention as being the basis for that decision not to include Paris. In other words, pre climate change committee October. So it cannot explain, it cannot explain the scoping decision. Now, in the skeleton for this court, then we just anticipate what Mr. Rich tries to say. He tries to say, oh no, that was an evolving process. That was an evolving process. But that is not what the Secretary of State's case was before the Divisional Court, nor what his evidence was before the Divisional Court. That's why, perhaps grindingly, I have focused you on exactly what the Secretary of State said in the skeleton, and exactly what the witness said in her witness statement, and exactly what documents she was referring to 
it may be that the scoping process was evolving, but there is no evidence at all of a fresh or further consideration of scoping in or out Paris post climate change committee evaluation. But Does that this answer cannot stack up otherwise. No, 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 I interrupted you. Um, well, that, that, is, that is why we say, um, even if, contrary to our primary submission, relevance is a question for the technical state's judgment, which we don't accept, his explanation on relevance simply does not add up. I wanted really to ask how you put the case. Is it these two submissions? One, uh, that there was a failure to consider the point at all. Well, there appears to be. These well, that's your submission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying it's right, yeah. but that's your submission. One, public law error because there was a failure to consider the point. But two, if the point was considered, uh, the test which the court applies is whether the court thinks something is relevant, not whether the Secretary of State thinks it's relevant. Yes, I suppose I might put that way, put those points that way around, but yes. Yeah, no, I, I know you do, but, yes, yes. But, but logically it seems to me that if you didn't consider the point at all, then uh, that, that uh, point comes first. I'm happy with either way. All right. Now, on, on the second of those, I'm not. I'm not following that. I'm afraid. Uh, if it's a permissible, relevant consideration, then we come back to the Creed NZ test, don't we? Well, uh, in my submission, my Lord, it's not. A, it's not. A, it's not. Um, the, the, the framing of Annex One uh, Lib E is not framed in that way. It talks about the relevant uh, evaluations um, and, and well established. Um, where, some, where the question of relevance arises, and the question of relevance is a question of the court, weight, etc. Well, um, I'm, I'm not sure that is well established. As I just said, Creed NZ says that uh, there can be a range of considerations which are neither prohibited nor mandatory. Well, let me, let me put it this way in the context then of this framing, um, which is that what we have here is a Lib E which talks about international, domestic, and European, um, which manifestly doesn't allow for the international to be ruled out merely on the basis that it may or may not be implemented in the law in due course. So um, uh, what we then have to do is we then have to say what international agreements are in the frame here, if you like. Um, what are the, because you may well say there are international agreements on all sorts of things that have absolutely no bearing on Heathrow whatsoever. Um, and then one says, well, uh, manifestly, um, the Paris Agreement, and no doubt others too, um, are relevant international obligations, <coughs> and they fit the rubric. Yeah, well, that's the point. The, the, the word manifestly may be where the burden of the submission lies. The re really, it seems to me at least, for the moment, this, this comes back to your earlier submission, that it was obviously relevant. Yeah, that, 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 that's not the same thing as saying that it's for the court to decide. Well, well that, that's, if you like, that's a nuanced fallback position. Yeah. We say it's for the court to decide. It's not for the court to decide, it's obviously material. Yeah. Um, or alternatively, to put the point the way my Lord Justice Lindblom put it to me earlier on, um, a, a decision to not include it would be an irrational one. Yes. I think that's where you put it the other way around, it comes yes. to the same place. Yes. Um, uh, but even if none of those succeed, and it's simply open for the Secretary of State in this case, we don't see a, a, a rational decision yeah. on relevance. Yeah, you're entitled to submit to us, I think, on, on, in the light of well established high level authority, that whether it is a manifestly obvious, a manifestly obviously material consideration is a matter the court has to determine, but not in the conventional sense of determining what is a material consideration in a more general way. Is that, is that well, the proposition? Well, yes, I, I do. And there's, there's a spectrum of points that you can go along this analysis. We start with saying it's for the court. But if not, it's obviously material. Look at the context. Then the court needs to grapple with that. Yes. If not, it, and it's uh, uh, evaluated one, the Secretary has to grapple with it, it's not all lawfully. It, it's a parallel to your earlier submission yeah. that this was see Creed NZ and further authority, a manifestly um, material consideration. And well, I look at it in the context of the uh, appraisal sustainability, which deals at, in detail and quite properly with the Climate Change Act and, and the EU training scheme and all the rest of it, but no mention of international obligations at all. And just to deal finally with a point Mr. Uh, Marici takes about the, the sort of nature of Paris and whether it needs domestic implementation to get it through this doorway, but first of all, my Lord, it, it, it can't be right that international obligation requires domestic implementation to get it through the doorway because we have international obligations in the, in the shopping list, if you like. Um, if they needed to be domestically implemented, then we would simply talk about EU and domestic legislation. So that <coughs> is plainly there to catch 
be as yet unimplemented, that's the worst case, <coughs> international obligation. I think there's also a shadow of a point that says, well, Paris doesn't set targets, but that's not the language of little, lim little e of Annex 1. It talks about international obligations. Sorry, objectives, international environmental objectives, and Paris undoubtedly sets those. Yes. Well, Lord, in terms of the, the test um, on how one then factors that, that failure um, into uh, 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 the outcome of the legal question, um, you'll see that below we took the, as it were, the conventional approach relating to the United States, Shamal Estates, and cases like that, um, uh, in which, yeah. in a sort of post Blewett kind of world, I'm just um, the question was whether there was uh, an obvious hole in the environmental report rather well, than how it was filled. That's conventional jurisprudence, which is familiar to the court. But that's why I won't take time on it. We say this is an obvious hole yeah. to use the formulation in, in um, paragraph 78 of Shadwell Estates, which you've got in yeah. uh, Legal Materials Tab 47. Yes, well, we're familiar with that. Um, obviously, the, the uh, extension of that is, uh, which we now, in this court, adopt uh, what Mr. Fleming, I think, will say in due course, which is a more intrusive approach <coughs> by the court to the content of environmental reports. I don't propose to develop that uh, at all. Um, we simply coattail on what progress he makes on that bold and sufficient. Well, we'll wait for his coat, shall we? Um, well, is that, that, that ground. Um, um, no. Um we, we've asked you one or two questions, not a great many. Um, I'm, I'm nearly done. I'm maybe a minute away. <laughs> Very <laughs> good. I'm not sure whether I need to address you or not on the mass energy test. Um, I may leave that to see if what Mr. Marucci makes of it. No, I, I don't think we need to trouble you at this stage on um, I'm the mass done. energy I don't test. I to address you on relief for all the obvious reasons. No. Well, in that case, I am finished. Thank yes. you very much, Mr. Wolf. Let me just ask my colleagues whether they wish to ask any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Add my rearrange of furniture. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, Mr. Crosland. <coughs> um, my Lord, so I, I don't have the advantage of my learning friends in terms of previous experience before this call, I'll aim to use this call of time as wisely as I can. Yes. Uh, well, you're, you're conscious of the timetable, we know that. Um, we may ask you questions as we go, just as we have of Mr. Wolfe. Um, but um, let's see how we go. And I just, just one practical point, so there are two supplementary bundles on climate change. Yes. Um, Friends of the Earth and Plan B. The agreement was that Plan B wouldn't duplicate material in Friends of the Earth's bundle, so if you could yes. have both bundles to hand. Yes, we, we, we have all the bundles close at hand. If I may just pick up, I'm grateful to my then Mr. Wool for his submissions to <coughs> the uh, His submissions on section 10.3, but we'll say uh, very little else about uh, section 10.3. But there's just one point where uh, maybe we can help the court, and that was the question around uh, the Climate Change Committee and its advice on uh, why the government shouldn't implement a new target now. Yes. If I may take the court back to um, Friends of the Earth Supplementary Bundle, this is 219, that's the Climate Change Committee's report from 2016, page 21. And in the first paragraph of the executive summary, you'll see it said, in line with the Paris Agreement, the government has indicated it intends at some point to set a UK target for reducing domestic emissions to net zero. I'm so sorry, I think I must have, must have misheard your reference page. So this is um, Friends of the Earth Supplementary yes. Bundle, and it's um, tab 2, and um, ah. the exhibit begins at page 19. Yes, I'm so 21. sorry, I misheard you. <coughs> so 
this is the first bullet point under executive summary. Yes. Thank you, yes. And the committee notes that the government has expressed its intention to introduce a new net zero target in line with the Paris Agreement. So where, where, are you on, where are you on the page? This is the first bullet point under executive summary on page 21. Yep, got it. So we say the context of this advice is recognition by the Climate Change Committee that the government's policy is to introduce a new net zero target in line with the Paris Agreement. <coughs> and we see at page 26 of the bundle, this is under the heading Implications for UK Policy Priorities in the Nearer Term. Towards the bottom of that page, under the first set of three bu bullet points, the committee say there will be several opportunities to revisit the UK's targets in future. And they cite um, specifically the opportunity to learn more, for example, from the IPCC report into 1.5 degrees. And then here we're helped a little bit by history. We know that what happens is that in October uh, uh, 2018, that report is published. We know, and it's, this has been mentioned already, that the government had seen a draft of the report in January 2018. And it's also clear, and we'll come to this further, that following that draft, there is recognition not just in the UK, but internationally, that things are extremely urgent and that work must speed up. So that is the context. This is what the Climate Change Committee was saying in 2016. Let's just wait until we have more evidence. And the IPCC report may be uh, uh, an important moment. Yes. More generally, as, as uh, uh, Mr. Wolf has pointed out, the distinction between uh, our position and Friends of the Earth is that we emphasise Section 5.8. We do that primarily for this reason. We say that is an easier route to the same point. Can I just ask you about that, Mr. Costan? Because I want to be sure that I've understood what submission is. It, does, it, does it come down really to this, that uh, Section 5.8 draws attention to the phrase government policy and that do you submit that one of the government's policies is undoubtedly that it is thought fit to ratify the Paris Agreement and therefore it must think the Paris Agreement is a good thing? My Lord, indeed, but it, it does go a little further than that. Right. We say not only did it ratify it, yes. it had stated publicly on many occasions <coughs> that its intention was to introduce a new target domestically to give effect to the Paris Agreement. So that, that, that may cause more difficulties to your argument. But it's both, it's both that. Yeah, no, I understand that. But, but, but do, you need any, do you need any more for your argument than the simple proposition that it is a part of Her Majesty's government's policy to have regard to the Paris Agreement? Because if, if it were their policy that it ought to be ignored... Why do they ratify it? My Lord, indeed. indeed. I, just, I just want to be clear, that is part of your submission. It, it is. It's a large part. It's the heart of the submission. And the way we put it is that the uh, public commitment to introducing a domestic target is simply further evidence of that position, that commitment to the Paris Agreement. You support that submission with, for instance, page 21, which you've just showed us, which is the Climate Change Committee saying in terms the government has indicated that it intends, at some stage, to reduce to zero. We do indeed. We will also take the call to some more um, unequivocal expressions of the government's intent on this point, but yes. Um, and we spend most of our time on Section 5A because um, it does have the advantage that government policy is a mandatory criteria for the Secretary of State to take into account. So again, for that reason, 
would we see this as the easier route to the same it, it may, I don't know, it, it may also have the advantage from your point of view that it doesn't require any consideration of the so-called dualist problem because policy is policy. It doesn't require domestic legislation. My Lord, indeed, throughout these proceedings, um, from the very outset, um, we sought to avoid the court's time being uh, spent on matters of international law. We made it quite clear that has nothing to do with our case and nothing to do with our argument. We accept entirely this is a dualist legal system. We don't ask the court to find that the Paris Agreement is legally binding. That has been no part of our argument. It has been a, a, a straw man argument that Mr. Marucci has been contesting on that issue. And your point is, my lord, has to you is that policy is a broader concept. It isn't just what is in the law which has been enacted. It is government policy generally as a wider in, definition. Indeed so, my lords. Um, it was, would have been quite possible for Parliament to frame Section 5A differently. The two pieces of legislation, the Climate Change Act and the Planning Act, were passed simultaneously. If Parliament had wanted to confine Section 5A to the Climate Change Act Section 1. It would have been the easiest thing in the world for it to do so. It chose not to. It chose instead to uh, require the Secretary of State to consider the direction of the executive policy, which gives more flexibility. Um, and my lords, we say the interesting situation we now find ourselves in, where there have been developments since this matter was heard in the court below, explains precisely why Parliament chose to legislate in the way that they did. Um, we don't say, of course, that the fact that the law has now changed was itself something that the Secretary of State could have taken into account because it hadn't happened at the time. We understand that judicial review is not a rolling uh, program, as the Secretary of State um, puts it. What we do say is that law doesn't just appear out of nowhere. The relevance of the fact that um, the Climate Change Act has now changed is that it confirms what uh, we have been saying all along, which is that there's a clear government policy in place to introduce new domestic legislation in accordance with the Paris Agreement. And... Um, the fact that the law has now changed simply confirms that. Um, in the ordinary course of events, it's the will of the executive that comes first, and then you have le you, you may or may not have legislation to, to put that uh, into effect. You say in summary that policy, government policy, is normally the precursor to legislation. Precisely so. Yes. This is perhaps putting the same point another way, or it may be a different point. You do submit, perhaps simply, um, that the United Kingdom government's um, adopted obligations through the Paris Agreement are an embodiment of government policy. It is indeed. Policy understood in its necessarily widest sense. In its widest sense, um, um, we also say that if, if clear government statements to do something, in other words, to introduce a net zero target and not government policy, it's hard to see what is. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll come to those statements and how clear and unequivocal they are very shortly. Yes. My Lords, if I may just provide a, a little bit of background before trying to hone in on the, the issues between the parties. Um, so on the 12th of December 2015, it was 196 governments including the governments of um, 
USA, China, India, Saudi Arabia, UK government adopt by consensus the Paris Agreements on Climate Change, and that agreement committed all countries, both the historically high emitting and the historically low emitting, to work together to limit warming to uh, well below 2 degrees and pursue efforts to 1.5 degrees. And it was just a few months later, in March 2016, that the UK government then made um, unequivocal commitments to introduce a new net zero target to align with that agreement. And my lords, that is in the narrative. If you look at um, uh, March 2016, um, 14th March 2016. Yes. Right Honourable Andrea Letson MP. I'm sorry, I missed, I didn't hear the reference. C1, page 10. Um, C1, page 10. Thank you very much. Thank you, yes. The time, uh, Andrea Letson, <coughs> Minister of State for Energy. Forms Parliament, the government believes we will need to take the step of enshrining the Paris goal of net zero emissions in UK law. The question is not whether, but how we do it. There is an important set of questions to be answered before we do. And then more or less that's repeated by uh, Right Honourable Amber Rudd on the 24th of March 2016. At the time, she was the Minister for Energy and Climate Change. She said, as confirmed last Monday, during the report stage of the Energy Bill, the government will take the step of enshrining into UK law the long-term goal of net zero emissions, which I agreed in Paris last December. The question is not whether we do it, but how we do it. To get a, a sense of, um, a further sense of the significance of the Paris Agreement from the perspective of the UK government, go to uh, 125 of Plan B supplementary bundle. Your, of your so, supplementary. I'll take the part of my um, 19. In your supplementary bundle. This is the government's clean growth strategy published uh, in October 2017. My learned friend, uh, Mr. Marici, perceives that this is part of government policy on climate change. This document is published under sections 12 and 14 of the Climate Change Act. I'm sorry, I, I've got the wrong page. Where are you? This is... Um, Plan B supplementary bundle. Yes, I have that. And it's page nine. Oh, it's at one page nine. It's the then Prime Minister's <coughs> forward. Yeah. Is that right? Indeed. Yes, thank you. And you'll see the forward from the Prime Minister um, there on page nine. If you go to the last paragraph on the left hand side. On the world stage, we were instrumental in driving through the landmark Paris Agreement. Go through this quickly, turn over the page. Page 10, this is the, the um, minister's forward, the minister at the time, uh, Greg Clark, Minister for Bays. And again, the last paragraph on the left-hand side. Following the success of the Paris Agreement, where Britain played such an important role in securing the landmark deal, the transition to a global, low-carbon economy is gathering momentum. Page 11. Yes. It's the next, next page in the bundle. The first bit of text at the top, um, on the left-hand side. The UK played a central role in securing the 2015 Paris Agreement. Um, and I'm just 
just going to skip out a couple of lines there. The actions and investments that will be needed to meet the Paris commitments will ensure the shift to clean growth will be at the forefront of policy and economic decisions made by governments and businesses in the coming decades. And you rely on the use of the word policy there. Indeed we do. So the difficulty though may be the use of the tense will be. Well, you submit, in, 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 in you submit that in context it must mean will continue to be. Indeed. Right. Or that the actions will be in accordance with the, the policy which we're stating here currently. This, this is our policy and this is what we expect not just to happen in the UK but around the world. And uh, we're taking a leading role in that. We're going to show, set an example. And then, my lords, to move on to page 14. This is part of the same document. This is uh, the UK government explaining why that shift to a more stringent temperature goal is so critical. It says... Um, these climate change risks increase rapidly <coughs> above 2 degrees, but some risks are considerable below 2 degrees. This is why, as part of the Paris Agreement, and it then goes on to say we agreed to a more stringent goal. This agreement recognised that in order to achieve this goal, global emissions of greenhouse gases would need to peak as soon as possible and reduce rapidly thereafter. is government policy on climate change, published under the Act itself. So this is a clear statement of commitment to the goals and objectives of the Paris Agreement. If I may turn you to um, tab 2, page 57 of our supplementary bundle. Proceedings in Parliament. This is May, uh, 1st of May 2018, so still before uh, the designation of the ANPS. Was this referred to in the court below? It was. And Claire Perry, um, uh, on behalf of the government, tells Parliament. Um, we were the first country in the world to ask how we will get to a decarbonised economy in 2050. This is the last uh, sentence, my lords, on the bottom of page 57. And I would hope that we could enjoy cross-party support for something so vital. In other words, this is the government, the executive, reaching across the house, saying we hope we will have parliamentary support for government policy in this vital area. My Lords, Plan B's position in relation to these matters has been clear and consistent throughout these proceedings. Um, the Paris Agreement, core part of government policy on climate change, and everything that we see just reinforces that. For the purposes of this hearing, it is the Secretary of State's position that the Paris Agreement and developing thinking on its implications, as he terms it, were not relevant considerations for the purposes of Section 5.8. But it's relevant to point out that that was not always his position. I learned, Lord, if I can turn you to um, the core bundle Volume 3, tab 9, page 1501. Full bundle, volume 1, page 5. My Lord, um, I'm just 
just noticed the yes, time. Yes, I, I, I noticed the time, and I was going, going to say to you, um, it may be better if you're going to develop a new point now to uh, leave that until we resume <coughs> after the short adjournment. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll rise in a moment. Um, the members of the court must attend the swearing in of a new Lord Justice of Appeal, which is due to start at 1.30 today. Uh, we do not expect to be late coming back for the afternoon session here. Um, if there is delay, we apologise for it in advance. But we will resume just as soon as we can uh, at or after 2 p.m. Thank you. All rise.